Welcome and good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Ken Wells. I'm with the Washington Hospitality Association. And um, we're here today. I'm in the business development department uh, where we support our insurance program, including our industry's workers' comp and retro program. Uh, this morning, we want to provide you with some best practices for reopening your business while keeping your employees and guests safe. Although um, we don't have the ability to shift the governor's thinking on what we might want to re on, on on when we might reopen and the requirements for reopening, uh, the association is working with the governor and his staff to ensure that they understand our industry. Um, and it's also important that they understand that our members have the best information and support uh, from us to make the transition more bearable. So with that, um, since our webinar today is going to be focused on best practices and reopening, uh, if there are any HR questions in some of those other areas that um, feel free to submit any of the questions, but some of them we won't be getting to today because uh, our focus is really going to be on the reopening part of, of uh, for our employees. We'll try to answer as many questions as possible. Um, however, if your question does not get answered today, there will be follow-up on, uh, on everyone that's registered uh, and we'll get you the answer or resource that you need. So on our panel today is Jessica Keller, our Executive Account Manager for the Association's Workers' Comp Retro Program. Say hello. Hello. Good morning. Thank you for joining us. And Curran Bauer, the Vice President of Program Management for Earn West. Good morning. And then last but not least, Keith Mayfield. You're not last, Keith. <laughs> um, the Regional Loss Control Manager for Earn West. Good morning. So to get started, I want to lay the groundwork here. We've been getting a lot, in a, a lot of questions around best practices for cleaning workplaces, protecting staff and customers from infection. So which I think mean, we all know that's important. Uh, but what to do if our business has an outbreak and how to respond. So let's get to the tough stuff first. Uh, let's start building and implementing a response plan. So that's obviously something that everybody's got to be thinking about today. Um, I've read that uh, strong response plans as an operator myself should have include several different elements, including identify exposures, risk, um, putting in basic infection protection protocols, which is important now, and building workplace controls. So with that said, let me ask some questions here. Keith, could you break down the main elements of a preparedness and response plan for us? Sure. Um, so what I'm going to tell you is what we most currently have from the government, from our local uh, state government. Um, it could change, but what we have right now is basically focused on the uh, DOSH Directive 1.7. Uh, there are five elements that we're looking at. Uh, number one would be educating workers um, and your customers. Number two is doing everything you possibly can to maintain that social distancing of the six feet that we've talked about or heard about. Um, Number three, be regularly cleaning any areas of frequent uh, high touch. So, and we'll talk about those a little bit later. Uh, number four, making sure your facilities have hand washing stations and sanitizer readily available. And then finally, uh, just how to deal with the sick and post sick employee illnesses that may come in or out of your uh, establishment. So I don't think we've all been thinking of necessarily all those areas, even though um, I think as you kind of put them all together, it does make a lot of sense. Uh, Jessica, what are some of the basic uh, protection protocols that any business um, could start with today? So I we really think that uh, any business could uh, be doing a risk assessment today. Um, that you have a little bit of a slowed down time right now and so now is just a really good opportunity to say okay what are my risks just in general and now what additional risks have has covid um, added to my my accident prevention program um so some safety protocols first just start with the risk assessment um uh, some other ideas are considering if you can have a one-way flow with your guests that come in do you have an opportunity to have an, one entrance and one exit um considering uh looking into your point of sale systems uh, do you have a tap to pay option um considering disposable menus um single use condiments i know that there's going to be a lot of discussion that gets talked about of, of different ideas um so right now we just want to um have 
owners and business owners, operators, really just focus on the little pieces um, that they can maybe pre-order. We know that hand sanitizer is going to be a, a staple. So do you need to order a, a standalone uh, unit that is right at your front door? Um, do you already have some of those things? So do an audit of your business. What pieces do you already have in place? Um, and then just start really thinking out of the box of what what could be helpful. Um, simple as um, I've seen some bathroom doors that have a kick plate on the bottom where you can open the door with your foot rather than your hand. Um, putting a garbage can outside of the restrooms so if folks want to open it with a tissue um, that they have a, a disposable, you know, a receptacle outside of the restroom. So um, really just take a moment to kind of think what, um, what can I, what can I do? So for what I'm hearing, when you say risk assessment, I mean, I mean, really thoroughly going from the front to the back of the house, kind of making your own checklist from an employee's and customer standpoint of view about uh, about some no contact, you know, type of ways I can change things, social, you know, keep the social distancing. And obviously, you know, we'll, we'll talk about cleaning and disinfections, but kind of really kind of taking it from scratch taking our, our old way of doing things and adding to it now that we've got this pandemic going on. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes. Okay. All right. So um, I'd say employees in food and lodging property properties, I mean, they're in the low to medium risk uh, category for exposures and for in uh, from the workplace. Keith, what kinds of physical barriers or personal protection equipment should operators consider implementing? And Jessica uh, uh, and, and Karen, if there's anything to add after Keith, please add. I would say probably the most common, uh, common ones that you're already seeing and will see for a long time to come are going to be any kind of uh, disposable gloves. It could be nitroles or plastic or anything like that. Um, it's very likely that we're going to be seeing more face masks. Now that doesn't necessarily mean like an N95 respirator. Uh, it could be just some kind of a cloth covering for both employees and potentially customers. And um, some places are even starting to implement, and you've seen this, the sneeze guards or the shields between um, workers or high contact areas, uh, for example, uh, hotel uh, check-in areas. They're sometimes putting up those face shields and kind of what we call a sneeze guard, for lack of a better word. So those are the most common right now that we're seeing out there. Okay. That's exactly right, Keith. When we, uh, you know, as, as Keith mentioned before, we don't we don't have the full detailed directive from the from the governor at this point, but. You know, I think we can look at what, what some other states are, are doing as they're starting to relax restrictions and look at what the governor's done in, in some of the other industries and, and, and take some cues from that. And, and Keith's exactly right. It's definitely going to be gloves. It's going to be masks. It's going to be those kind of things. And as as not only in Washington, we look at opening up more industries, but, but other states are starting to broaden out. We need to be thinking about supply chain on that, the availability of those items. And so you know, you don't want to wait until uh, you're trying to open next Monday to, to be running around looking for masks or hand sanitizer or, or gloves or whatever. It's, it's it's probably prudent to start start looking at those items now. Right. And then we obviously, I mean, not obviously, but, you know, we have no idea what, you know, comes down from local health departments and, and the governor, mm -hmm. et cetera. But right now there are some things out there that are kind of showing that, you know, what direction, like you said, cloth masks. They're not in 95s. I mean, they can't get in 95s out to everybody tomorrow. But um, um, it, it's, it's obviously going to be a step-by-step -step process. So we have to watch what comes out of the governor office. We have to watch out what comes out of the, uh, the health departments. But more importantly is we do have kind of an idea of what's being said by things like the construction uh, uh, industry and others that are, you know, the, the, the current exposures or the current um, things that are currently open today. So, so uh, mask, I think, is a great one, right? And gloves are, are probably the two most common. Um, Keith, what should operators do if uh, their staff shows symptoms of illness? First of all, I think it's really, really important that you have a procedure set up, ready to go and put into place and you've got every worker trained on what that procedure probably is going to look like. Um, now what we're seeing as far as coming down from like the CDC website and local health departments is 
if at all possible, we want to try to get that potentially sick employee into somewhat of an isolated area. If it has a door, great. If it doesn't, um, we want to try to get them isolated as soon as possible. Um, maybe even a mask if they don't already have one on. Uh, let's make sure that we can get them or they can get to um, either home to self-isolate or a medical facility. Uh, and very important that we finally kind of protect others that are in the restaurant, um, be it customers or if it's a hotel or, you know, whatever. We just want to protect other employees and customers from coming into contact with that isolation area, if at all possible. Sure. It's a good point. And, you know, you hear about a lot of businesses, Keith, that um, uh, that are, are testing employees essentially on the way in the door, checking temperatures mm -hmm. and things like that. Um, you know, is that something that as we look at, at reopening restaurants and hotels and, and things that it, it could be a good practice for uh, for operators to, to consider? Yeah, and it, it could be. It could be. In fact, we did see something. And I was talking to Kern yesterday that that employee employers are actually going to be legally allowed to test their employees before coming back to work. So it's something and again, it's that preparation that we're looking at. So I should send the employee home. Yeah, if you possibly can, send them home. Absolutely. Okay. okay. So I, I just want to be clear because at the end of the day, I think it's important that we're not afraid to move forward and make a decision for something that we need to do to protect our other employees and customers. You got so, it. Um, okay. All right. So should operators be making a, um, a list of changes and not just changes, right, of things we add, okay, because I think we're all, we all think about, okay, now I got to add this, I got to add that. But how about the things not to do? Uh, to address habit changes, I mean, you know, training, that kind of thing. So who wants to take that? Go ahead, Jess. Yeah, I think, um, so it kind of ties back to um, owners and operators, they need to document everything. If we can't prove it with a, with a documented piece of paper, then it didn't happen in the eyes of the state. So I would say any uh, safety measures that you are adding, any additional policies, now's a really good time to look at your employee, you know, the safety board area where you have all of your labor law posters. There is a few additional required posters, um, which you will have links sent uh, to everyone. Um, but that's a, a really good time to say, okay, Am I being transparent enough? Um, you know, do you have a lot of uh, maybe non-English speakers that maybe you have to be a little bit more creative because there isn't these items in multiple languages in print. So um, partnering with uh, somebody who is bilingual to make sure that all of your staff is crystal clear. Um, and so yes, absolutely make a list add it to your accident prevention program, add it to your disease preparedness plan. Um, if that's all one, awesome. But yes, document everything that you are doing um, in order to keep your people safe. Okay. Yeah, I, think so, I think that's a key point, uh, Dan, because really when we get into to, to something like this that really is a, you know, a public health type of an emergency, it really is about being transparent and having as much information out there as possible. We really want to avoid a situation where uh, where, it, where it can be perceived that an operator maybe had some exposure out there or exposure to the public out there um, that, that wasn't well communicated to a health department or, or to the, the regulatory authorities um, because that that could get that could get pretty ugly pretty fast. Um, and and L and I is starting to see uh, from time to time now some complaints with workers who are returning back to the workforce. Um, uh, complaints filed with L and I talking about how maybe an employee wasn't. Um, provided the proper PPE or the right steps weren't taking, and they're taking those very seriously. And that's obviously not a road we want to go down. So, so just what we're talking about today, coming in and having a good, comprehensive plan uh, right up front, and communicating as clearly as you can with with members what steps you're taking as the operator to try to keep them safe and keep guests safe, or it's going to go a long way. So, I want to throw a question in here. Okay, and this mm -hmm. is a good one. Um, do you think kitchen staff should uh, mm -hmm. should get away with shields? with no mask or could get away, excuse me. Do you think the kitchen staff could get away with shields with no mask? I, I personally, I don't want to, I don't know that I would want to speak to that. I, we don't have the information necessary that we could say yes or no on that one. So I think that's one that we wouldn't want to really kind of say, I don't want anybody to take what we say as quote unquote gospel. So I think right. there would be more information needed. That sounds good. I'll tell you where my head went. They need to have a mask and a shield. Exactly. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, but that, that's just where my head went. <laughs> you know. I believe that I, I read in some of the other industries that there's some different protocols for what is um, 
required or appropriate if something is unavailable. They may have options, but given our industry, we we may not have those options. So. Right. Sure. Well, the, the question becomes really, um, we don't know what we don't know, right? There's mandated mm -hmm. that requirements that could come out. We don't know what those are today. So, you know, today that answer would be, you know, no, right? I mean, it, because that's not a requirement. However, we got to keep an eye. And then the second would be not just what's mandated. What do you want to do to protect your staff and your customers? So you've right. got to look at it from, from two diff different ways. Another, mm -hmm. another interesting question here, okay? Uh, can you review thoughts on processes uh, on, excuse me, on new processes for housekeeping staff? Again, I don't know that um, there have been any new processes put into place uh, because our industry hasn't really started opening up yet. I, I don't think we've seen anything from the health, local health departments or from the uh, from the governor to say what that might look like. I mean, there's all kinds of things out there that are that are flying around um, in different places. But as of right now, I don't know that there's anything we know enough of. I mean, it's obviously going to be more of a, of a probably hyped up cleaning mode. Um, but other than that, we don't really know. Sure. And I would just add to that, that, um, you know, some steps folks can take now while we're not quite opened up yet is, is really working with their chemical supplier to, to look at the chemicals they are using and if they are going to be appropriate moving forward. Um, there are definitely right. some, some kind of some guidelines and recommendations out there uh, regarding you know, disinfectants and chemicals and, and their effectiveness on, uh, on COVID-19. You want to make sure you're going to have those. You want to make sure you understand those. From a right. uh, you know from a, a safety and compliance side, you want to make sure you have the the safety data sheets on those, uh, right. and that your employees are trained for those that sort of thing. Right. right, and and a lot of these things, let's say, could not be mandated from the governor's office, right, or from health department. So let's say, uh, is let's let's use housekeeping as an example, but restaurants, hotel, you could use you mm -hmm. could use either any any business operations out there, right? They might not you might not need to change the way you're cleaning your rooms. However do you want to change the way you're cleaning your rooms and communicate that to the consumer because at the end of the day they feel more safe you know staying at your place mm -hmm. so i think there's their man again i'll go back and repeat the mandated things that can and or, or will come out over time right maybe not even initially but over time but those things that you might want to just look at doing to uh, to make your your basically your customers feel more safe yeah and you mentioned something there uh, ken that i wanted to piggyback on real quick and that's just this overtime idea and what we've seen as as the governor has opened up construction and things like that is is it does come out with a set of uh, of some kind of mandated guidelines um, that has some level of detail and then you tend, do tend to see those evolve as folks start to ask questions right uh, as we start running into particular scenarios that get brought up to, to the governor's office in the health department so it is a little bit of a of a moving target there or an evolution from you know, what we you know what we know today which is which is very little as far as detail to what gets announced until you know and then maybe a few weeks or even a few months down the road so right. just be prepared for, for a moving target yeah. jessica let me ask you this um what should team members do if one of their customers show symptoms of illness mm -hmm. so this one is a really it's it's a it's an uncomfortable um position that you may find yourself in um if you're you know hoteliers they can maybe have a little bit more conversation during check-in and maybe ask offer you know if you hear symptoms you can offer a glass of water maybe that um individual will uh, voluntarily you know say oh no it's not you know not a problem um in a restaurant setting um it's gonna be um a little bit tougher. Um, we don't want to put any of your server, uh, that type of staff, uh, at risk of having an uncomfortable uh, situation. So if uh, somebody does make it into a sitting down position at a restaurant, say, um, we suggest to get your manager involved uh, or HR if you have that, voice your concerns, um, and then ultimately the manager could use uh, their best discretion, um, best judgment to see if they would ask the individual to leave or not. Um, it may be, you know, it might be uncomfortable, but it m you might find yourself uh, where that's necessary. Um, I did read that hoteliers, you know, it's a it's a fine line, it's a balancing act of you know the all the acts that are in place um, and the rules of just asking that information. But um, you do still have the right not to to service people sure. um, if 
you know, you, you have a, a responsibility um, to the rest of your staff and your guests to keep uh, your establishment as safe as possible. So we don't want to get to there and hopefully the individuals that are, you know, ill are staying home and not putting us in that position. But uh, you may find yourself where the safety of the, the rest of the guests and the staff may come first. And but, so you may but, have to but more importantly, Jessica, you have to think of these things up front, have those responses prepared before you reopen. And you yeah. might even make a mistake or two along the way after you open on, on those decisions makings, right? But at the end of the day, you got to start somewhere. And mm -hmm. it sounds like to me, what I hear you saying is, look, it's going to happen. Uh, it, 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 you've got to be prepared on how to respond to it before it actually before that that uh, that situation comes up yes and you always you no matter who um is in the situation you always want a partner um especially in this gray area because you want to you know your actions to be witnessed and all of that good stuff and that's why i say to get a manager involved okay so keith let's say the same team member or the so a, a team member gets tested for covid and tests mm -hmm. is positive right okay what should we do and from the best practice standpoint you know what should we do about it sure um first of all you've got to make sure that you are notifying your local health department um they can give you really good guidance on on what they're what they want you to do um in a nutshell you're going to be doing some deep cleaning first of all we all know that um, any kind of surfaces that they've come into contact with on a regular basis you're going to want to wipe down obviously and sanitize uh, make sure they're clean first you know we don't want to choose sanitizer as our cleaner um, we want to clean and sanitize uh, don't let other people into the area until the cleaning is complete but again i can't stress enough that probably the first thing and not probably the first thing you need to do is to let your local health department know they will have everything that you're supposed to do and will walk you through the process to make sure everybody stays as safe as possible. Good point. Um, here's an interesting one. So we get lots of questions today. Uh, if an employee develops COVID symptoms while working, do we need to, to notify potentially affected customers? Today I would imagine that answer, right? Yeah, I would imagine. I mean, we don't know though if it's suspected. I would, I would hate to raise an alarm. Um, again, I think you need to contact your health department and kind of find out what what they what the protocol for that is. Yeah, right. I, I would agree with Keith on that because that, that is really something that, that the, a local health department would take the lead on as to how far they wanted to try to chase that those potential exposures down. And you know, we do want to be transparent. We want to be working with them, but we we don't want to call every customer that we've ever had since we re reopened and said. You know, and, and, and incite some level of panic there. So you, you don't even know who they all are, exactly. Um, right, and and then and then you know these questions about do we do we keep a log of customers that come in? I mean, let's be honest. We're going to have industry standards, and do we want to stick to the industry standards, or do we want to set our own set of protocols for our business? And then how much liability does that bring us for kind of having? you know, tougher protocols for someone to come into my business, as an example, you know, anybody that comes in, I've got to get their name and their phone number, you know, that type of thing. So, so, you know what, not here to make recommendations. That's not where we're going here. You've got to make your own as a business person, but at the end of the day, what is required? And then do you want to add on to that? Where does it make best business sense to do that? So those are the things to keep in mind as you're making your decisions, because everyone as a business owner will look at those decisions differently. A um, couple things that I, I noticed that you guys have to, to, to put out, which is the uh, an OSHA publication, which has guidance for preparing workplaces for COVID-19. Uh, I saw that myself. I thought that that was excellent. So um, Jessica, I, I know at the end here, we'll, we'll, we'll finish with you and you'll get some information out to all the um, the people that are attending here and registered for the uh, uh, for the webinar. But um, I think some of these resources that we have available are going to be good for everybody to do a once over, you know, before they do their assessment uh, risk, because I think it'll help them think about things that they're not thinking about today. Um, let me move on to the next subject here so we can keep uh, uh, we're not all here. We're not all here all day long. Uh, let's move to cleaning and disinfecting work sites. Um, a lot has been talked about in the media about how long the virus can live on different types of surfaces. Uh, there seems to be two basic approaches to, to uh, handling sanitation. Uh, one is compressed hours, 
to allow for deep cleaning each day. And then the second is uh, cleaning high touch services regularly, th re regularly throughout the day. Um, with that in mind, uh, Keith, I'm going to start with you and then, sure. you know, it, mm -hmm. uh, Jessica and, and, and Curran step in where you need to here. Um, what should operators be considering for their own business? You know, quite honestly, we're going to go kind of all the way back to what Jessica talked about at the beginning. I think each individual business owner is going to have to assess how your business operates um, and functions, and and it's going to you're going to have to come up with that plan. I mean, it's going to look different for each individual place. Uh, a restaurant that deals primarily in quick uh, fast food and doesn't have a lot of touching con going on as far as service is concerned, that's going to be one thing. Whereas if you've got a sit down restaurant, it's going to look totally different. Um, it's going to look different if you have booths and tables. So, I mean, quite honestly, it's going to be a lot of that's going to be up to your individual business owners to, to determine that hazard assessment that they have within their own place. Great. And I think that's Go ahead. Just on that little note, um, it's, you know, if you do have booths or tables, you know, think about, um, you know, what if we were going to open up at a 25% capacity? What would that look like for you? You know, draw your little sketch out. Which which booths would you have to, you know, cordon off? Um, you know, would you remove the tables altogether and put them in a storage area if available just to eliminate any confusion or lessen confusion. So um, we don't know what the requirements are going to be yet, but if, if we had to phase it in, uh, look at your location and what your physical barriers are and what would that look like for you? So a great one, and there's a barrier here, right? If someone's asking, should there be plexiglass shield on bars between bar staff and customers? Is it mandated? No. Do you do that? I, you know, I don't know. I go to a Walmart or I go to a grocery store and they have a shield between me and the cashier. Um, I might not no longer have 12 bar seats. I might have four, you know. Um, those are definitely decisions that have to be considered. But again, try to define the difference between what's mandated and what's not. Um, how frequently um, should high touch surfaces be clean? Who wants to take that? So I'll actually go um, in, in what I, I mean, obviously we have all of our standard cleaning protocols, so nothing has changed with that. A guest leaves, you clean up after them, sanitize, you have your bleach buckets that are all pH balanced, all that good stuff. Um, so as far, what, what we don't always think about though in cleaning the guest table is, you know, now we have to clean the guest chairs and seats and door handles and bathroom door handles. And so it's it's taking what you're normally doing and adding in these extra pieces that uh, you wouldn't normally be thinking about. Uh, I mean, how many times do you go to shake somebody's hand and now you're like, ooh, never mind. So it's gonna take some time for us to remember that um, getting gas, it's, <laughs> you know, we touch a lot of stuff right. and don't think about it. And so getting that scheduled cleaning, um, bathroom cleaning is most likely going to need to be documented moving forward is my, my guess. Um, but thinking about, okay, if I need to have a sheet that I've done the whole entire facility, I've gotten all doors, all handles, all, you know, even push through doors, you know, just kind of in the hat, in the risk assessment, figure out how many of those high touch areas you have, and then just getting a schedule. And then it's just done on the hour or every two hours or whatever. If there's mandates that come down with a specific time, um, or it's just after every guest leaves. So let's talk about deep cleaning a little bit. And I know you're going there, uh, but let's talk about deep cleaning because, you know, now you've got this, uh, you know, some chemicals out that are dressing viruses and stuff like that. So how frequently should you uh, should you think about deep cleaning to protect from COVID-19? Keith, do you want to take that one? Uh, just a real short answer. Again, we're going to go back to what they're being, what we're being told by our state right now is, unless you have someone that's been diagnosed with COVID or um, suspected COVID that come back and test positive, they're not necessarily requiring any deep cleaning. Now, I'm going to go back. You know, and Jessica said, "Hey, you're probably going to up your ante here when we're when we're sanitizing and cleaning things." But as far as the deep, deep cleaning, they're concerned with. There's not anything that says that we need to be doing that unless we have a positive COVID test come back. Okay. And then how about the chemicals? 
Well, there's lots of chemicals. I mean, I think Jessica, you talked yesterday. We talked yesterday about some new chemicals that you've seen mm -hmm. out there. So what I'm uh, what I'm hearing from some chemical suppliers is that they're stocking up on even an antiviral uh, cleaner. Um, the only thing that I ask is if there's, we don't, we're not sure of what will specifically be mandated for, for cleaning, but if we introduce any new chemical product, um, it is your responsibility to ensure that staff is aware of that chemical, what it's for and what the dangers are. Um, and then you just have to ensure that, you know, we have the links, um, we have links that will be sent out to the EPA, it has lists of appropriate chemicals for all of these things. And then you just need to ensure that your SDS uh, book, your safety data sheets are up to date um, with these new items that you've brought in. And you properly trained your employees. Good, good, good point. Training um, and documentation is absolutely key um, because people do make mistakes and we don't really know what these, some of these chemicals might how they might affect certain folks. And so we just have to train first and foremost because we're knowingly bringing a new product in. Right, right. So is there a chest, a checklist of places or surfaces that should get cleaned um, that people are not thinking of? I mean, is there like a place where I can go and I can get a checklist now that kind of help me start going in that direction and putting together my assessment plan man? Yes, there, uh, there's a number of different checklists. What what our team, the folks on the webinar today have been doing is really sussing that out for our industry because there hasn't been anything specifically mandated for us yet. So we're trying to just take everybody's best practices and, you know, we're, we're seeing what's going to stick to us and what we can uh, easily implement and, and how do we pivot uh, once the mandates do come down. Okay. And I would say too that there there might be those those areas you don't think about that are kind of harder to clean. Um, for example, some restaurants are using tablecloths. That might not be a good idea right now because you can't clean those, you can't sanitize those very easily. So, you know, anything with fabric or that's very porous are going to be surface areas that you want to think about either trying to eliminate or or think about a way to clean those easier. I mean, I think again, we're gonna keep hounding back and keep saying when you go through your restaurant to get ready to open, you've got to do that pre-hazard assessment and, and put these things onto that list to make sure they're taken care of. Sure. And one thing that, you know, that, that the governor's been pretty clear about as he's you know evaluated reopening particular industries is he's going to be watching them and his team are going to be watching them closely, um, really kind of watching that, that potential spike in that, in that COVID claims. And okay. you know, he's, he's made it very clear that, that, you know, if that spike gets too big, he has no problem. Kind of scaling things back again and we don't want to we don't want to get into that kind of a roller coaster so i, I do think it's worth as we talk about you know, what we're cleaning and how frequently we're cleaning it, it's probably worth erring on the side of, of caution and cleaning a little too frequently or a little you know maybe a little more than what might be officially mandated out there just so that we can try to keep that that spike from occurring and try to keep you know uh, easing restrictions particularly in, in hospitality businesses right right so we've got a lot of questions Go ahead. Go ahead, Jen. I just want to say really quick that um, sometimes we think that using more of a product will do a better job, and that's not the case a lot of times. It's going to be the more frequent use of the product, mm -hmm. not how much of the product. So I don't want anybody to, you know, not follow standard procedures when creating your bleach buckets or sanitizer or what, you know, whatever it is that you're using. Um, make sure that your staff knows to just use it more often, not more of the product. Right. Read your labels. Just re read, read your labels. labels is the most important thing because some things it requires them to stay wet for a while to get them to be sanitized and to kill viruses and germs. So you need to read your labels. Right. Right. So in general, there's a lot of questions here is about masks and gloves uh, between customers and employees here. I mean, I, I, I'm seeing my page filled up with this. OK, so at the end of the day, the, here, here's point number one. You got mandate. Right? Mm -hmm. Are your employees going to be mandated to wear masks? Employees mandated to wear gloves? Maybe not. <laughs> you know, is the public going to be mandated? Maybe not. So you've really got to consider what's mandated. What's not mandated? You got to start. I mean, that's something you have to make your own decisions on. That if uh, employees aren't mandated mandated to wear gloves and masks, do I want to put my employees in 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 in, in, in masks and gloves? Though, again, are personal decisions that you have to make that I personally don't want someone to make for me. But at the end of the day, uh, really watch what's coming out on mandated versus non-mandated, because at the end of the day, um, you, 
getting back to that normalcy is what's going to be important. And, uh, and we've got to let the experts speak uh, as we come out and we reopen because there's, there could be limitations. Again, we don't know. So allow the professionals to make those decisions. And then we, you know, should support those decisions as an industry to keep each other safe. So I wanted to catch that because in general, I've probably got 20 questions on my screen that are strictly about what if a customer's not wearing a mask? Uh, should, you know, why are we, uh, you know, assuming that employees are going to have to wear masks and gloves? There's no assumption here at all. Uh, we, we look at a history of what we're seeing in other states, of what we're seeing in other industries that are that are, are currently out there working and what might come down. But at the end of the day, let me tell you something, we're all right here in the aspect that we got to wait and see what uh, uh, what uh, what the governor and, uh, and our local health departments mandate. So I just want to keep that uh, that out there because I'm hoping that answers all really, it looks like 90% of the questions here. Um, I wanted to say when it comes to checklists um, that uh, I think one of the things that are that, that I see is that, you know, uh, Jessica, you've got some really good resources here. So I think that as you get that out to everybody, that will be very helpful. Um, and then um, there's just kind of a little odd question that's here. And I just want to, because I think this will open up the, a space a little bit about social distancing, which we haven't talked about. But if I'm a small diner, I think this is just a good question that's kind of isolated themselves down here on my sheet. If I own a small diner with boots and counter uh, service, and you know those are fixated, you know, seats there, um, how would you recommend I keep people six feet apart? And that's really, you know, I'll go back to what I was saying um, a bit ago. It's that's why. I would love for you to have that plan now. Um, you may have to just section off um, certain booths, every other booth. That may not, it, it may not be an option. Um, you know, but doing it early and understanding the more and more about your own facility, whether it's, uh, is 25% capacity feasible for you? Are you going to be one of the ones that can, is, is that going to work? Um, if you physically cannot open until it's say 50% capacity is allowed, um, that's where I want you to really go in, see what can I do and what can I just not do? Um, I've seen folks turn, you know, their back, entrance kitchen doors down an alley into a drive through um, So, I mean, and that's, I know that's not, it's different than in, in house dining, but it's, we're just going to have to be really, really creative. And um, yeah, if they phase it in and a 25% capacity is just not going to work, that, it's not going to work. Yeah. And I think right, that right. I, just, I would just add to that uh, on top of, of what Jessica said, to definitely start making that plan now about how you might need to rearrange your areas or you know, close down certain, certain booths or, or certain uh, counters or uh, counter seats to be able to maintain that six feet because that that is a, that social distancing is a requirement is something we've seen that's come up in other industries that are open, it's come up in other states. I, I think that one, while we don't technically know today what the, what the governor is gonna mandate, I think you pretty well bank on that one. Uh, so that's, I, that's I might have to tape off every other booth just to make yeah. sure no one sits there. And my okay. staff and the customers both know that this is about social distancing. Exactly right. Yep. Right. Yep. So, I know okay. it's not going to be feasible for, for everyone, but consider what your outside uh, area looks like. You know, yeah. hopefully we have some good weather, but, you know, could there be some additional tables that could be set outside mm -hmm. to just expand your dining area, given that your parking lot is probably not going to be full. Um, so think about that. Um, is there anything additional that you could temporarily uh, install? Right. Yeah. Okay. So in any workplace, uh, there's potential for work-related accidents, right? So having an accident prevention plan, otherwise known as the APP in place for your business, uh, is extremely important. Making sure that your team is actively uh, practicing workplace safety, we, I think we all know, is kind of standard today, uh, not just in OSHA requirements, but to really just, you know, address workers' comp and, 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 and keeping, basically keeping our employees safe. Um, so, so all this is, is, it's about keeping our employees safe for all workers. So question, Jessica, let me ask you this first. If someone currently has an APP plan in place, does COVID-19 change it? If so, how? 
So it doesn't change the APP as a whole. It's really you're going to have to add an additional chapter to your existing APP. Um, and it goes back to the requirements are it's about education uh, and, uh, you know, what is the virus? How is it spread? Um, and employers really have to, it's not just about uh, telling them, they actually have to enforce it. So um, there's m maintaining that social distancing space, um, the regular cleaning of the high touch areas, which we just discussed, getting that checklist of what those areas are. Um, and so if you have this um, additional chapter just to add into a, a currently working APP, then this is where you want to house all of your documentation and training. Um, workers must have facilities for frequent hand washing, um, including hot, cold, or a, a mixture of the two, which equals tepid water. Um, so having a good supply of, of hand soap, maybe consider doing, I mean, even having the touch-free uh, soap dispensers. Um, so there is going to be additional um, requirements, but it's just essentially a chapter that would be added to your accident program. Or, or sections in the APP? I mean, do I, does it have to be a separate chapter or is it just making sure that COVID-19 is covered? I think it needs to be a separate chapter. I haven't seen it specifically from DOSH yet, okay. but um, just so it can, you know, these are the standard procedures that we do, and these are okay. the additional measures that we have uh, implemented due to this. Pointing fire. them out. Okay. Mm -hmm. Keith, Karen, anything? No, I mean, that's exactly what she was saying. I, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you, that's that's what we've done is um, we're coming up with, we've been looking at what the DOSH directive says and just kind of coming up with a, a little bit of a chapter that this specifically states exactly what the employer has to have in their APP and even to the point where we it eventually either can or help provide those those pieces to them so they can just insert them into their existing APP and keep on going. And, and making right. sure that you know that that when you're bringing folks back in, they know that that new information's in there. They've been trained on it. They can they can go to it if an LI inspector shows up tomorrow and says, "Do you know where your accident prevention program is and where's your COVID protocols?" To anybody on your staff, they know right where to go to get it. Most importantly, is not just having the plan; is actually training it and making sure it's implemented across the board. Because you exactly. can you can have a plan, but if no one you know knows about it, then it's not doing good. Um, just if a business currently doesn't have an APP plan. Um, is now a good time to, to implement one? And if so, why? Absolutely. Now is, now is the silver lining. It's one of the best times because you are not at the volume of full capacity. Um, uh, you have a, a few staff members with uh, that need some stuff to do. Um, so right now, in my opinion, is one of the best times to do it. Um, can you help me get one if I need one? I mean, at the end yeah. of the day, let's say I've never had one. Can you help me out? Yes. So um, my friends here at Earn West have actually, they created one for us uh, many years ago, and um, we played with it uh, over the years, and we have a pretty comprehensive, um, ultimately an accident prevention template. We've kind of thrown everything in the kitchen sink. It's ultimately up to each individual employer to figure out what is applicable to their facility. We think that we've gotten all of the pertinent information, but if you have a specific uh, piece of machinery, um, you know, a, a very unique facility, um, you might have to have additional chapters in your APP that isn't in the template. Um, the template is sectioned out. Um, first and foremost, what I would encourage everyone to do is the biggest concern right now is going to be around chemicals. That's going to, you know, we don't know what else is coming in. There's high volume coming in. Um, and ultimately, chemicals are um, one of the main areas of compliance violations. And usually one violation can turn into, you know, up to 10 to 15 violations, depending on um, what your training documents look like. Do you have your SDS sheets? Um, where are they at? Are they behind a locked door? Um, so the accident prevention program, it's, it's uh, the main point is to keep uh, your staff safe. But ultimately, it is the employer's responsibility to have that document specifically tailored to that location and notify the staff of it. Because if they cannot prove it to l &I that it was done, they are in violation and they will have uh, 
compliance issues. And then not only that will be monetary, um, but then they'll be in a very short window to correct any issues that they may have. And so right now when nobody's really on your case about it, it's a really, really good time to do chemical inventory. Um, what do I have? What do I need? Is there stuff here that just doesn't need to be here any longer? And if that's the case, dispose of it. Figure out what is needed for your business to run and get rid of all the rest of it. Right. And then anything that you are going to keep in house, you have to have documented and employees trained on what it's for and why it's there. Right. Good question here because not everybody might know. Uh, what is a DOSH directive? Oh, <laughs> so uh, Keith, jump in anytime. So um, it, it's our a DOSH directive. So it's Department of Safety and Health. Um, the federally, we have OSHA. Um, OSHA uh, encourages each state to have their own state-run plan. It either has to match OSHA's requirements or be even better. So you'll notice that Washington State actually has a few additional requirements than even OSHA, OSHA does, um, and that's because our state holds ourselves a little bit more accountable. Um, so if we were to be inspected, if we were to have a, a guest or a, a, a worker um, call and complain about lack of PPE, um, that would be the Department of Safety and Health through the state of Washington Labor and Industries that would be uh, coming to meet with you. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. And so that directive that, that they're talking about is there are pieces that the Department of Safety and Health will send down and say, hey, this is what you are to do at this point in time. So the one that we've been talking about, this 1.7 that came out, is actually right from the Department of Safety and Health saying, here's what the pieces are that you need to have in place. It's a very long document, very wordy. We've just kind of, what we've tried to do is get it down to where it's user friendly for our, for our members that are in the association. Right. Uh, there's a question that comes across about any usable insights for, um, or excuse me, any insights on reusable linens and tablecloths. Uh, yeah, that's starting to be addressed out there. There's manufacturers coming up with that. Also, same in bedding. We're starting to see that question uh, be addressed by manufacturers out there. Um, again, there's a lot of questions about governor's mandates here. I, I just want to reiterate that the association is, uh, is working on the behalf of our industry with the governor's office. Again, you know, we don't have the ability to shift the governor's thinking, but um, but we, we do have input. We are at the table uh, having those conversations so they know what's important to the industry. Cost is also important to the industry as well as protecting our employees and of course the customers. So we'll keep that in mind. There's questions on there about do I require, if I require someone to have masks, can they pay, you know, like they, pay for their own, you know, pants, do the, you know, can they pay for their own mask? All that, you know, let's see what comes out of the governor's office. But uh, in, in, in theory, you would hope that if someone's going to wear a mask that, you know, they, they have that opportunity to, to bring their own. But, you know, again, we'll see, you have to wait and see what happens in those particular, uh, what comes out of uh, mandates first. Now, and I just um, go ahead, add that absolutely. There was a question um, we were talking about like housekeeping um, a little bit ago and I just wanted to throw in that um, typically our housekeeping staff, they're, they're, um, they're used to having to be uh, trained on the bloodborne pathogen policies. They know that they have to take extra special precautions in certain areas. So as there may be new mandates that come out for cleaning of rooms, um, our housekeeping staff is really um, a group that is used to wearing gloves and used to you know taking extra precaution um, and so as new cleaners come out for that type of area if there is you know with bedding and whatnot if there's an antiviral so um, it's just adding to their training but they're already a, a, a robust uh, trained group of folks right so a resource that we might want to think about that's going to come up here uh, I see this coming up in question is is in masks and especially cloth masks that are out there is those potentially being re-sanitized and then what those opportunities are. So um, I hadn't thought about that prior to this particular uh, uh, webinar, but that's something that maybe our equal labs of the world can, can help us with and, you know, our bartering and et cetera, 
to, you know, what potentially can be done. You got to remember these things are over people's face. So uh, you got to be very careful. I do also just want to throw out there that ultimately if the masks were a mandated uh, piece of uh, required PPE, that it would be on the employers to supply them. Um, I think there may be some uh, middle ground of, you know, can I bring my own? Can I not? But ultimately a PPE requirement is at the employer's expense. Excellent point. And um, speaking with the distributors, the broadline distributors and, and even the smaller distributors, they are working on resources for masks and gloves and thermometers. Um, as we speak, they're all bringing them in-house. Some are taking pre-orders, et cetera, et cetera. Our Office Depot program has, you know, has masks and thermometers. So at the end of the day, uh, we're seeing the distribution system uh, ramp up for that. So. A uh, couple things here before we wind up. I want to make sure that you guys have some good resources. So uh, visit the hub uh, dot uh, for the coronavirus resources. You'll also see the webinar will be uh, come up as a webcast within the next 24 hours. Jessica here will be reaching out to everybody and sending them a kind of a follow-up email with some of the resources that we have for checklists and things like that to help people get started. Um, you know, I want to thank the panel here. Um, Jessica, uh, Keith, Karen, thank you guys very much for being here. Uh, this was some excellent information. And then thanks everybody for attending. Uh, greatly appreciated. And, um, just realize we're here for you. And uh, Jessica, what's your contact information? I think that's important if someone, you know, really wants someone from the association to help them out in this area and they need some additional information. Let's say that just gets missed. How can someone reach you? Absolutely. So uh, my email, um, and I, again, I'll be sending out an email to you so you'll have all of my contact information. Um, right now, my email is Jessica K at wahospitality.org. Um, my okay, okay. <laughs> no, so, yeah. no, no, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Um, go ahead. I just look forward to hearing from anybody who does uh, feel that they, you know, maybe you don't have any experience with an APP and now you're sweating it. Um, call me or email me because I'm happy to share my template. I'll be uh, sharing it with everybody, but I want to just make sure that. Um, no question is a dumb question because you don't know what you don't know either. And I live and breathe this stuff uh, all day long. So um, even if I don't know the answer, I can find it. Um, but don't hesitate to reach out um, because we want to be that resource um, and make sure that you're doing it right and that you're in good shape for when we reopen. <laughs> okay. Next week, uh, we're going to have a webinar on uh, the supply chain. There's a lot of supply chain gaps. There's a lot of questions out there. So if you're in HR, make sure your operators need or vice versa. If you're an owner and you want to know what's going on in supply chain, there's a lot of questions there. Um, you know, menu management. I mean, there, this whole reopen is really kind of, is, there's just asking a lot of questions. The question always comes up is when is the governor going to make announcements? Hey, we, we all think it's going to be tomorrow, right? <laughs> we're, we're led to believe. Hopefully by the week, that by the end of the week, we'll get some more information about what's the next steps. Um, we're, we're here to work and, and help you on your behalf. So thank you all for attending. Hope to see you on our next webinar at uh, 10 a.m. on this will be Thursday versus Wednesday next week, which, like I said, will be uh, the supply chain um, gap issues that we're having that's going to affect our, our menu. So thank you all very much. Panel, Jessica, Keith, Curran, thank you very much. Glad to have experts aboard that can answer some of the questions. And Jessica, you're going to be a wealth of resources for everybody. I'm sure they're looking forward to getting your email. So again, thank you all for attending. We'll see you next week. Thank, thank you. you.